Dr. Leslie Francis, I'll pass it to you now to uh, uh, lead us through our uh, session this morning uh, on church going and Christian ethics. Uh, I will, for the sake of the recording, mention Dr. Francis is the, doctor, is the director of the Center for Pastoral Studies at Warwick University uh, Medical School in uh, Wales. And uh, this uh, venture, I forgot to have my recording turned on if you're wondering why I'm repeating myself for the third time, is uh, being offered this morning and recorded for the benefit of those who will uh, view it as a recording on our Queen's College website YouTube channel uh, as part of our continuing education for clergy and pastoral workers. Welcome to all who are here and those who are online and those who are viewing it uh, as a recording. And on to you, Leslie. Good morning to you and thank you for the welcome to join this particular conference. I was looking forward to travelling, as you know, on Friday and then got attacked by a bug. So I've stayed at home, but a real joy to be allowed to still participate through this wonderful technology to which you've introduced me. Let me first of all say just a tiny bit about the perspective from which I'm going to make this presentation, and then a bit about the title. Then I'll get on to doing the job you've invited me to do. I see myself first and foremost as a practical theologian when I'm doing this kind of work. But I do practical theology in a fairly distinctive way known as empirical theology. Theologians have tended to adopt perspectives from other disciplines. And I think that enriches the activity of theology itself. What empirical theology does is to go and raid the skills of the social science faculty and bring those skills inside theology. I don't see myself as a social scientist looking at the church from the outside, but as an empirical theologian using the tools of the social sciences from the inside. And the particular perspective I take within the social sciences is that of quantitative psychology. I'm a psychologist by trade, as well as a theologian. So I'm making a presentation as I would make it to psychologists, as well as I would make it to theologians. Now the second bit of introduction is to do with the title I've chosen. Some of you may recognise that I've stolen that title. Not only do empirical theologians go and steal tools from social sciences, they actually begin to steal titles for their presentation. The title Church Going in Christian Ethics is taken from Robin Gill. Robin Gill is recently a professor in Canterbury at the University of Sussex. Now, Robin Gill, like me, sees himself as a theologian using social science techniques. Where we differ, is that Robin sees himself first and foremost as a sociologist of religion, while I position myself as a psychologist of religion. So that's a bit of background as to where this presentation comes from. What I have here is a structure of a classic empirical presentation. I'm going to give you an abstract. I'm going to give an introduction that deals with a certain amount of theory. I'm going to look at the method that I use for this particular piece of work. <coughs> and then I should go on to look at conclusions and results. I seem already to have lost the pot with this. Here is the abstract. And the abstract is the piece of work that I would say to a student read the abstract clearly and you will then not need to listen to the rest of the presentation. I apologise for this today, but I seem to have lost... Here we are. Good. 
This study explores the connections between church going and two fields of Christian moral values, sex-related values and substance-related values. There's a sample of just over 23,000 13 to 15 year old students in England and Wales. And this is a subsample of a larger database, but a subsample of those who self identify either as Christian or as of no religion. In other words, those affiliating with other faith traditions are not part of this analysis. I use two statistical techniques to explore the association between church going and those fields of moral values. The first is by variate correlation. That's what Robin Gill did in his foundation studies. And what by variate correlation and cross tabulation can do is to identify clear patterns of association, one thing with another thing. In this case, church going with Christian ethics. But that kind of analysis cannot take into account the more complex environment in which this connection works. So I move on in a way that Robin didn't to draw on to multiple regression analyses. And when I do that, they confirm that the association still persists, even after I began to control the other factors, personal factors and psychological factors. In the paper, I will explain why I do that. So we begin to see that Robin's conclusions are robust. But I take multiple regression analyses one stage further to see whether further variance in the association between church going and Christian ethics can be explained by two other aspects of religiosity that I call intrinsic religiosity, and I'll contextualise that later. What this shows is that personal prayer and belief in God account for more of the violence than church going itself. And that what church going does is often mediated through those aspects of intrinsic religiosity. So more broadly, these findings illuminate the connection between the Christian community and communities of moral values. Let me move on to the introduction and try to give some broader contextualization for this particular study. The title Church Going in Christian Ethics has been unashamedly borrowed from the book published by Gill. And there's been a clear reason for doing this. Empirical investigation of the broader connections between church going and moral attitudes or ethical values has been well established over the years within the secular discipline concerned with the social scientific study of religion, especially the sociology of religion and the psychology of religion. Robin, however, moves the, the centre of gravity from the empirical investigation of the connections between church going and Christian ethics, firmly within the fields of practical theology and Christian ethics. Robin sees himself as a practical theologian working with and Robin argues that the theological and philosophical discussion of Christian ethics would be incomplete without accessing information about how real and actual Christian communities function as distinct to ethical or moral communities. Although not aligning himself in the late 1990s explicitly with the developing field of empirical theology, Gill's thinking at that stage had much in common with those of us who were pioneering in theology. I draw attention to an article by Mark Cartridge, who was summarising how the field was developing at the end of the 1990s. Gill opens his book by arguing that Christian ethicists have been bashful and reluctant to admit that sociology has any constructive role to play in their discipline. It's rare, he says, to find a Christian ethicist prepared to examine data about the moral effects of church. Instead, he argues, Christian communities have become far too idealized, 
theologians and sociologists alike have tended to assume that Christian communities, at least in their identifiable form as congregations that meet together and worship regularly, had little beneficial moral effect upon Christians. And it's that Gill wants to change. Against that background, Gill draws on a range of data to challenge such assumptions. The data that Gill assembled convinced him that, and I like this quotation, whether or not someone goes to church regularly is a very good indicator of a whole range of beliefs and moral attitudes and behaviours. Church goers are more distinctive than is often imagined. So against Gill's setting a background, what I want to do in this presentation is to examine the evidence that Gill advances to support his case. I want to document compatible sources of evidence. I want to interrogate a new source of data. But then I want to extend Gill's bivariate analyses. I want to do that in two ways. First, by introducing control variables, things that might contaminate, distort, extend, or mitigate the association between church going and Christian ethics. And then I want to go beyond church going to explore the motivation behind church going. Gill, as sociologist, is interested in observing what people do. I, as a psychologist, I'm more interested in digging down to why people do what they do. So here is a look at Gill's evidence. Gill recognised the extent to which social scientists were already publishing on the connection between church going and what he might himself want to call Christian ethics. And he draws on two particular studies one by Gary Baumer in Australia, called The Religious Fact in Australia, who identifies four levels of church going. And Baumer's study shows the way in which the range of issues that are of conversational interest to Christian ethics may be answered differently just according to four levels of church attendance. These are the kind of statistics that Dixon and Bowman produce. Not a great difference, but one that's statistically significant. Ah, and regular church goes so much better. A second question, often popular in surveys that are trying to tease out what religious belief has by way of effect on issues of sexuality. Again, by four levels of church attendance, Australia, 1986. Gary discovers the real difference comes with those who are regular attendants. Prostitution, another issue that they investigate. Again, by their four levels of church attendance. And I'm going to move through these figures quite quickly because it's simply giving some of the background of what existed to inspire Gill to go on and to think more carefully about these associations. And you're still seeing these pictures clearly your end, I guess. So Gill then moved on to look at the study that I produced with my colleague William Perry, Teenage Religion and Values. And in that book, I used three levels of church attendance. Gill looks at three kinds of areas that he extracts from the huge range of data that William and I put together on He speaks of altruism. To what extent are altruistic attitudes changing according to levels of church attendance. Concern world poverty, a higher level of percent among weekly church members. Concern about the risk of pollution to the environment, a higher level of concern among church members. 
he moves on to the end purpose of life. What's life about in young people's minds? I feel my life has a sense of purpose. Now for a psychologist, sense of purpose is an important motivator behind a whole range of ethical behaviours. Three levels of church attendance, 49% of young people who never attend, 60% of those who attend sometimes, 68% of those who attend them. But then well-being measures tend to distinguish between the positive aspect of a sense of purpose and the negative aspect of suicide mediation. From Durkheim's classic work, religion has been seen to be one of the great inhibitors of suicide. To what extent does church then still function in that kind of way? The proportion reducing according to the level of the church. And then the third area that Gill took out of the work that William and I did in Teenage Religion and Values was to look at some moral issues. Attitudes to pornography by three levels of church attendance, clearly a relationship. Attitude towards abortion by three levels of church attendance, clearly a relationship. It was those earlier pieces of work, particularly Gary Bowner's and my own work, that encouraged Robin here to look at two classic examples of data collected in Britain, the British Household Social Panel Survey and the British Social Attitude Survey. And it's from examination of those data sites that Robin establishes his thesis. I want to argue that Robin's thesis is too simplistic, that moral values, ethical values, are correlated with not only church attendance, but what I want to call personal and psychological factors. I want to argue that these factors need to be taken into account before looking at the direct relationship between church attendance and those issues of morals and ethics. And the first thing to look at are sex differences. Robert, uh, Michael Aguirre's classic survey of empirical psychological studies in religion in 1958, first real review of literature, says that sex differences in religiosity is the most established finding that can come out of the growing literature that then existed. I reviewed that in literature in 97 and with a research student did so again in 2014. In Christian and post-Christian cultures, Across a range of indices of religiosity, women emerge as more religious than men. It's silly to look at the relationship between church attendance and other factors without taking sex differences into account. The evidence about sex differences in religiosity is not in doubt, but the cause is in doubt. And there are two broad theories that are at work. The sociological theories, recently reviewed by David Bose and his colleagues, that look to the social context, the social environment that treats women differently from men, that shapes women differently from men. But then there's a different school of thought, psychologically grounded, and a classic example of that is a study in the Journal of the Social Scientific Study of Religion in 1991 by Thompson. I replicate Thompson's study relentlessly over a period of time because I'm really interested in testing psychological theories for accounting for difference in religiosity. And my argument is that the psychological theories actually trump the sociological theories. They are more powerful. If you take personality into account before comparing men and women in religiosity, then knowing that they are male or female makes no difference. But psychological masculinity, psychological femininity, personality differences. 
Then the second major factor that contaminates potentially Gill's findings are age differences. We know that there's a different level of religiosity across different age groups, different age cohorts. One of my own studies shows that more recently, Lee's analysis of the British Social Attitude Survey shows that. There's a bit of an aging effect, but there's even more a cohort effect from early adulthood through to late adulthood. But then one of the things that William and I looked at in our 1996 book, which we call Drift from the Churches, is the extent to which there are significant deteriorations in religiosity across the age range 8 to 16. So whether we're looking just at young people or at the whole population, not to take age differences into account, is plenty. What about psychological differences? Going back to Argyle's classic review of the literature in 1958, Argyle says, at that stage, there's not enough evidence to show whether or not personality affects religiosity. But by 1997, when Argyle and Dakar Army revisited the people, they changed their mind. They said that there is now enough evidence to show that psychological differences impact differences in religiosity. And one of the reasons they changed their mind was the consequence of the work of my own research group that has quite relentlessly been employing ISIS modern personnel to check its predictive power in the field of religiosity. Isaac's model talks about personality being summarized in three higher order factors, extroversion, neuroticism, and psychoticism. I argue these three factors need to be taken into account to the extent that they contaminate the relationship between differences in religiosity and differences in social values. And it's particularly psychoticism that counts. Isaac's understanding of psychoticism has two components. One is he argues that psychological disorder is continuous with normal personality. And second, that it's possible to define a continuum from what he calls tender-mindedness through tough-mindedness to psychotic disorder. That's what the psychoticism scale is designed to produce. My 1992 paper identifies psychoticism as the dimension of personality fundamental, fundamental to differences in religiosity. And there have been many replications since then. Again, you see, as in sex differences, there's not the evidence that's involved, but the cause. What factors are going on? I think originally work was very interested in conditioning. I think spoke of conditionability into tender-minded social attitudes of which religion is one. And those who score low on psychoticism condition more readily. These two classic papers that make that up. I take a different view, and I take a view that sex differences lead to personality differences, and that differences we see between uh, the differences we see associated with psychoticism is that it is a feminine disposition that goes with low psychoticism. My most recent review of that. In 2020. So, so much for arguing that Gill's work needs to be seen more in a more complex way by looking at control values. But the second thing I want to know is that church going has to be contextualized. This is Gill's argument. Gill was well aware that church going may be only one index defining the Christian community. But he argues, and here I use the word argue because he never demonstrated it. He argues that church going is the core religious factor in shaping and sustaining a moral community. 
He describes this as the cultural theory of Russia. He argues that this theory suggests that it is church going more than religious belief, which is the independent area. That is to say, it is church going which fosters and sustains a distinctive cultural belief and values. This culture is not static over time. It does change in relation to broader changes within societies, and particularly in relation to the global changes across societies. That's Gill's position. Gill argues that the practice of regular church going, with church congregations acting as moral communities, reinforces distinctive beliefs and values. In turn, such beliefs and values generate and sustain individual As a psychologist, I want to question whether it is church going that matters or the motivation behind church going. And the vocabulary shaped within the psychology of religion to talk about the motivation behind church going is often styled as religious orientation. Religious orientation language has its roots in the work of Gordon Oldham and particularly in a measure that Elport and Ross developed and published in 1967. In their measure, they try to distinguish between two different styles of motivation for church life. The intrinsic orientation, where people go to church because of an intrinsic commitment. Religion is an end in itself. And on the other hand, extensive orientation, where religion becomes a means to another end. And they came to develop that in order to give an account of the regular findings in the late 50s and early 60s that churchgoers were more prejudiced than non-churchgoers. There's a lot, they said, in the Christian tradition which would free people up from prejudice. Why is it that church girls generally are more prejudiced than non church girls? In trying to measure the motivation distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic orientation, they unravel some of this complex interaction that's going on among church girls. And they find that intrinsic orientation is associated with lower prejudice, while extrinsic orientation with Orientation theory has moved on since the original work of Alport and Ross. That's an inventor's classic book, brings in a third dimension that they call quest orientation. And my own work, a paper in 2007, develops some new measures, which I call the new indices of religious orientation. The reconceptualize slightly and reoperationalize those measures of orientation, the new indices of religious orientation. Can I bring into the question that really sets out some access to religious orientation here? And the question is partly yes, answered partly yes, and partly no. Using broad surveys that are designed to tackle a number of issues, it's not always convenient to bring in a 27 item measure of religious orientation. But there are proxy measures for intrinsic religiosity. Personal prayer. People who pray are doing something on the inspired example. And indeed, personal belief. The surveys I do among church girls tell me it's not unusual for people to attend services on Sunday, but not to pray on Monday. It's not unusual for people to have congregations in England and Wales, having them people who are not clear about the link in God. But there's something in the social context, the social activity that keeps them going. So I'm proposing in this study to use personal prayer and belief in God as proxy measures for intrinsic religions. So I've set up my problem. 
I want to give some very brief insight into how I try and get my answer. 163 schools across the Union and Wales agreed to participate in this survey. To remind you that schools within the state maintained system in Union and Wales were set up by the churches from 1811 onwards, long before the state came into business to set up schools itself in 1870. And as a consequence, church schools remain quite prominent within the educational state-maintained system in the United States. At secondary level, they are not so prominent as they are at primary level. At secondary level, the Catholic Church provides about 10% of school places and the Anglican Church about 7%. And a lot of what the church schools are doing at secondary level is operating admissions policies that prioritise church going families. I oversampled church schools because I wanted to get into my database enough young people who were church going. Church going is no longer a popular activity among young people in England and Wales. So the figures that I go on to use at this stage are not figures about the population because I've oversampled church schools, but it's the association that I'm looking at, not the level of academic. I have from this data just over 27,000 participants, and from that, <coughs> excluding the other religious groups, a database of 23, 24. Among whom 13,000 identify as Christians, 10,000 as Methodists, no religious affiliation. Among those who identify as Christians, Anglicans lead the pack, but quite often to claim to be Anglican does not mean to claim to be Catholic. These are the pictures. Methodism, not a strong denomination. A mixture of males and females, a mixture of year 9, 13 to 14 year olds, year 10, 14 to 15 year olds. And the measures? I'm measuring moral values across sex related issues and substance related issues. Simple questions. It is wrong to get drunk examined on a five-point Likert scale. Agree strongly, agree, not certain, disagree, disagree strongly. That's how we go to a point. Church attendance. This is my measure of church attendance, and I'm collapsing the very few who said nearly every day into once a week. Seventeen percent of this age group in England and Wales do not go to church. But I've oversampled schools with all the disadvantages. 48% never seen. Personal prayer? I collapse once a week and once a month. Occasionally and never. Leaving God? 32% with girls theists, 24 as agnostics, and 44 as atheists. And then personality. I use the junior Isen personality questionnaire abbreviated. Four six item scales. Extroversion, neuroticism, psychoticism, and the so-called life scale. Each of those items is answered yes or no. And the scale is constructed by adding together the responses of the six items that can capture it. So at long last, in a boring scientific presentation, we see we've got some results. And what do they look like? Step one of the results is to look at the bivariate cross tabulations. How one thing goes with another thing. And I get 
these cross tabulations by adding up the agree strongly and the agree responses to become yes, and the not certain disagree and disagree responses to become no. And they're cross tabulated by three levels of church attendance weekly, never, and all of those in between that I've characterized as occasion. What do we say? It's wrong to have sex before you're married. Quite a jump for weekly church days. Pornography is wrong. A jump for weekly church days. The differences are similar to those in percentage terms from what was discovered by Gary Balmer in the 80s and by uh, Marion Worthy William Clay in the 90s. Abortion. These are the issues I looked in relationship to sex related ethical issues. And on each occasion, there's a clear bivariate association between this one here and church attendance. Similarly, the homosexual. Move on to the items that I selected for substance related behaviour. Wrong to get drunk. Clear by their relationship. Wrong to smoke cigarettes. Clear by their relationship. Cannabis. Clear by their relationship. Wrong to drink alcohol. Clear by their relationship. And on each of these occasions, the relationships that are reported are relationships that are statistically significant at a high level of probability. They're not figures that you've got by chance in that regard. But, you see, I'm not content with that level of analysis. I do need to move on to the multivariate analysis to see what happens when I take control variables into account and what happens when I take intrinsic religiosity variables into account. And what I'm presenting on the screen now is perhaps the most complex bit of the presentation. But it's worth looking at because it does give some insight into how it is that the statistician working with these data may extract more meaning from the data than would otherwise be seen. So if you look at the first column down where there's the heading R, the R is the bivariate correlation coefficient. The extent to which the, the independently those factors that I've called personal factors, psychological factors, church attendance and religious factors correlate with, in this case, an attitude that says it's wrong to have sex before you're married. The first correlation, 0 0.04 against sex, has got three stars which says it will not have happened by chance one time in a thousand. Correlation with sex needs to be interpreted by knowing how the data have been coded. Conventionally in social science, males are coded by one, females are coded two. This is a positive correlation because there's no sign in a positive correlation says that as the value of sex goes up, one male, two female, so the agreement with this statement goes up. In other words, females take this view significantly more than males. The minus next to age shows that between the two year groups we're looking at, 13, 14 year olds, 14, 15 year olds, there is a decline in the agreement with this statement. Looking at the psychological factors, you see that minus the extrovert says that the more extroverted you are, 
the less likely you are to agree that this is right. The minus with psychoticism says that the less high you score on this, the more likely you are to see this is right. Frequency of church attendance, high. But so are, you see, the personal factors of prayer and belief in God. Those bivaric correlations don't tell us that much. But we then are building four different statistical models. And you can see by the pattern of figures that each model adds something extra to a model before. So model one has just the personal factors, model two adds psychological factors, model three church attendance, and model four the religious factors the intrinsic factors. Look at the row <clears throat> that says delta. And that is the increase in the variance accounted for by the model under which it is placed. So that in the top row, R squared, model 2, 0.04, model 3, 0.17, delta increase of 0.13. That tells me a significant bit of variance has been accounted for by adding church attendance to the model. But move on to model 4, and you've got even more variance accounted for by adding intrinsic religiosity. If you add intrinsic religiosity, you get a better explanation than if you have just church accounts. Now look along the row that says frequency of church attendance. The R squared, column one, 0 0.37. In model three, church attendance comes in 0 0.36, hardly changed by having the control variable. But then in model four, it's really dropped. It's dropped to one four. Church attendance is not by itself explaining all that amount of the variance. A lot of what appears to be explained by church attendance in model three is actually rooted through personal prayer and belief in God in model four. Now, I probably don't want to take the time by going through too many of these, but you will see that the second one, pornography, works quite differently from the first one. <coughs> What's really different about pornography, if you look at delta, the increase in R squared, almost entirely happens in model one women are much more against. In model two, personality is adding just a little. Church attendance, only a little. Intrinsic religiosity, only a little. What makes this model what it is, is the important difference between men and women. The control variables are more important to the on this account. And then a third example on getting drunk. And the only line I want to draw your attention to here is the line to do with frequency of church attendance. And I'd like you to say the extent to which the beta rate, 0 0.22, drops to 0 0.08 when personal prayer and belief in God is put into account. Now, I want you to argue from this that the relationships between the predictor variables and the output aspects of ethical decisions actually fluctuate according to what that ethical issue is about. So, the good news for you, as I've almost concluded, but I will just draw some conclusions. This study explored and developed Gill's thesis regarding the connection between church going and Christian ethics and peace. 
Step one employed by various analyses to map the connection between church going and Christian ethics. This supports both findings 20 years later, both findings being to do with sex related and substance related. Gill's thesis studies. Step two introduced two kinds of control variables, personal factors, psychological factors. These control variables do not undermine the connection between church going and Christian ethics. Gill's thesis is secure. Step three, introduce the notion of religious orientation on motiva or motivation underpinning church attendance. This addition adds to Gill's thesis in two ways. One, personal prayer and personal belief taken alongside church going increases the predictive power and offer a more complete account of how the Christian communities and communities of moral and ethical values interact. Gill's idea that church going counts now has to be qualified. It is Christian appreciation inside church values. Adding personal prayer and personal belief demonstrate that much of the predictive power of church going is rooted through the intrinsic factors. Elport was correct that church going by itself is a crude of the Christian community. There are limitations with the study. It's a very restricted age range, 13 to 15 years. I've used only a limited range of ethical issues, two subgroups. I've got a poor measure of religious orientation. And I've not exploited the potential of adding denomination to the measure. We know very well that across important issues, Catholics and groups like Baptists are going to think quite differently. Say about alcohol, say about abortion. I'm not taking that into account. But what I have taken into account, I presented. And I really want to say thank you to Rick for inviting me to look at my database with Christian ethics in mind. Because you see, the database wasn't set up to do that specific job. And had the invitation not come to present at this specific conference, I may never have got round to seeing what was inside this database on this particular issue. I'm glad I have, because I think it's been worthwhile and useful to do. And I hope that this style, the style of the empirical theologian, may encourage others to take seriously the observation, what is going on inside the Christian community? How can we best illuminate it? And what variables do we need to take into account? Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Leslie, for a very interesting presentation. And uh, we'll take some time now for comments or questions, observations from anyone who is here or online. And uh, for those who are uh, online, you'll notice if you're confused between my accent and Leslie's, uh, well, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely have a, a poor audio connection. But uh, for those who are here in the room, uh, please identify yourself uh, and uh, where you're coming from, uh, in the sense of whether you're a student here, there, or wherever, or uh, whatever your role and station life is, uh, so that uh, those who are listening will know from whence the question and comment is coming. So let's uh, uh, hear uh, questions, comments, observations from anyone. One, one thing that I will ask you, Leslie, and, and it was very interesting to me, because recently, very recently, just Monday, at our faculty meeting, we had an interesting discussion. We're looking at the issue of theological education for the future. Uh, not altogether similar, at least in title, to this conference, Ethics for the 21st Century, but theological education for the future. And one of the uh, items that came into our discussion that we'll be taking a look at and probably uh, having some presenters uh, uh, do something in, in one of our continuing education sessions, as well as trying to see what modifications we've been making to our programs, uh, is the notion or the, the term that's often used, and now it's a category on uh, Census Canada, um, 
when they, they do their surveys on uh, one of the categories of religion is spiritual, not religious. And uh, I'm just wondering if you would make a, a comment from your own studies and, and particularly in relation to this uh, study, uh, how that concept is uh, a factor and how that uh, uh, way of identifying oneself uh, relates to, to values and, and ethics. Yeah. That, that's a really interesting question. Um, the, I'm really interested too in the way in which census data works and I'm concerned when census data begins to confuse categories and one of the things I was responsible for in the past was chairing the groups that got a religious question into the census in England of Wales for the first time in 2001 and I drew quite heavily on the experience of Canada in designing the question. What I'm clear about is that religious affiliation is one thing. And to make sense of religious affiliation, then the question has to be about affiliation to recognized groups. And there's a category none for those not affiliated. Now, self-assessment of religiosity can take place in a variety of ways. And so can self-assessment of spirituality. Within this survey of 27,000 young people, I have two simple questions that are set out in exactly the same way as every other question, alongside an agree strongly, agree not certain, disagree, and disagree strongly. One of those questions is, I am a religious person. The other question is, I am a spiritual person. I have not looked at this database yet, but I have looked at the database that I ran among 34,000 young people 10 years ago with those two questions. And it's possible with those two questions to get a, a, a matrix of those who say I'm spiritual and religious, those who say I'm spiritual and not religious, those who say I'm religious, not spiritual, and those as I am money. Now, using a technique called discriminant function analysis, it's possible to take a data set like mine and to ask which of the many other items within that data set allows you to build up a paper of what makes those four groups different. And I'm particularly interested in what makes those who say I'm spiritual and not religious different from those who will say I am religious. What I find in that is that there are a range of cultural and moral issues that separate those groups out very clearly. Just in brackets, I do a similar kind of job for seeing what makes the person who says I'm an atheist look different from the person who says I believe in God. Discriminant function analysis is quite an important tool to do that. One of the reasons for wanting to do that with those who claim they are spiritual and not religious is if, as the North American literature suggests, this is a growing category, if we can find out more about what makes that category what it is, we might be able to predict something about the way in which, in this case, ethical values and moral norms may be following a different trajectory. So what I've done there Rick, is to give a kind of higher level answer without giving any real information about what the evidence says. And the reason for not saying what the evidence says is until I get that paper out of my filing system, published three or four years ago, I kind of the moment remember. But I do remember the process uh, and the kind of stuff I want the empirical theology to do when I'm grappling that complexity. One further observation okay, is that the category in England and Wales of being spiritual and not religious is nowhere near as large as the 
data from the USA suggests is the case there. What we have in England and Wales is a bunch of young people saying, I'm neither religious nor spiritual. Now that does present a very different and interesting trajectory from, from the consensus that comes out of the USA research. That's it. Right. Thank you, Leslie, for that one. Other questions or, or comments? Don't be shy. Class participation grades are <laughs> very relevant. <laughs> Anything from anyone? Yes, great. Fine. Fine. I observed uh, one comment. I'll, I'll just ask you to uh, to uh, identify yourself so Leslie knows who it is. Okay. Crony Squibb, I'm a student at Queen's College doing the Exploring Faith program. Um, I observed one comment you made was that churchgoers are more distinctive than often imagined, and I believe that is exactly what we are called to do, is to be distinctive. Yeah, pre pre precisely. And I think one of the real values of the empirical sciences is that it can hold up a mirror to churches to test the extent to which what churches are claiming about their distinctiveness is in fact reflected in those who are part of the church's community. And that was, I think, part of Robin Gill's original challenge to Christian ethicists in the late 1990s, saying, stop talking about idealized Christian communities and start looking at real Christian communities. Because you might find in looking at real Christian communities, you've got empirical evidence that things really are different in those communities. But then, having kind of said the first challenge is to hold up a mirror to the Christian communities, I think there's a real value for that mirror to be interrogated on the inside and to see the variety of difference that takes place on the inside. One of my books, 2005, I called Fragmented Faith. And I called it Fragmented Faith because it was a study of the internal beliefs of Anglicans in England. And I recognise that there is enormous diversity in beliefs and moral values within the Church of England. On the one hand, that's an enormous strength. One denomination that can hold difference creatively in tension. But it's also an enormous weakness because at certain points that creative holding in tension explodes. And the flashpoint in 2005 that stimulated that book was to do with the consecration of a gay bishop. Diverse opinion within the Church of England as to whether this is good or not good. And what are the factors that predict that diversity? Well, sex predicts it. Women take a different view from men. Age predicts it. Younger Anglicans take a different view from older Anglicans. But perhaps, not surprisingly, churchmanship predicts it. The evangelical Anglican takes a different view from the Anglo-Catholic Anglican. Put all that lot together and you get a church in which Fragmented faith is not a bad title for a book, but it is not a title of criticism, it's a title of celebration, for a church is able to hold together that tension and remains committed to holding that together. End of comment. Great, thanks, Lucy. Any other questions or comments? Well, I just want to ask you one. Yes, Graham. Uh, Graham Greeley, I'm a theological student, and there's something that I struggle with uh, is uh, when you think of interdisciplinary uh, in terms of like psychology, anthropology, biology, so there is empirical evidence that uh, we know and the struggle to weigh that against the theological aspect of that. Like, uh, 
the weight, how much weight we put on the empirical evidence when we are uh, trying to uh, teach or understand or explain something. It's, uh, I find that a struggle because I'm looking to the empirical evidence, but yet I believe beyond the empirical evidence. Yeah, a really important question as to what empirical theology has to contribute to theological normativity. And from that point, we are open, opening up the question to do with revelation. What are the sources of revelation? What are the sources of the knowledge of God? What is it we learn from scripture? What do we learn from tradition? What do we learn from experience as each generation begins to experience God's revelation in a new way? It's a lot easier to set out, as it were, an Anglican position of the different tools that are available to theology in order to get insight into those sources of revelation. A lot easier to set them out than it is to forge agreement on it. Hence, as you go back, say, to the finding, predictable finding, of my book, Fragmented Faith, a different view of God's revelation given to the Evangelical Anglican from the view given to the Anglo-Catholic Anglican. Because at the end of the day, they are value evaluating the component parts of that theological jigsaw with different weight, different bits of source of revelation are being treated differently. Scripture given a different kind of weight within the Evangelical tradition. Um, so the problem you're wrestling with, Graham, is the problem that is the problem of the practical theologian living in God's world in today's contextual situation. And I think there's no easy way out of that apart from living it and taking seriously the diverse sources of evidence that come from those different components of the revelation that we take seriously. Great. Thank you, Leslie. I was just going to ask, uh, and, and we'll only take a moment to get a response from you if we can, but uh, there isn't much uh, available in terms of empirical studies that have a theological root and a theological uh, uh, framing to it. It's, uh, a lot of it is, you know, kind of related to what Graham was mentioning, trying to pick stuff out of other uh, studies that are done, and that can be good as well. But uh, in the practical level of it, at the pastoral level, um, where usually any counting that is done, we might say, <laughs> using quantitative measures, maybe some counting of heads or counting of enrollments or counting the collection, <laughs> but above and beyond that, um, you know, this type of study, validated and rigorous uh, in its design, uh, is just not very common, but are you finding that there is a, uh, uh, a growing interest in it? And uh, I know you are leading, you lead many students. Uh, uh, so you find some uptake for uh, empirical studies and, uh, and does it kind of relate to the trend, which is there in many, uh, many organizations to need uh, evidence uh, as the basis yeah. of decisions? Um, I think the first bit so in response to that question, Rick, is the way in which theology itself is a discipline that is open to development and to movement. Now, as far as within that broad discipline of theology, where does empirical theology rest? Well, 1987 was the birth of the journal Empirical Theology, and shortly after that, um, maybe 15 years, after that, the beginning of a continuing series of real monographs on empirical theology. A body of knowledge does get as journals and memory. And then I think it was in 2000 that the International Society for Empirical Research, actually, on the YouTube, and Ken McQueen, 
part of what I'm interested in is actually seeing the extent to which empirical theology is mandated in Jesus' own teaching. And I often go back to the parable of the seller. You want to find out about how the reign of God works? Well, just begin to go and observe what's going on and think about what's going on in a theological framework. There's an enormous amount of empirical theology that goes on within those parables. But built into that are important assumptions about how God works, about how creation is, and about how the created order works. That's theological stuff to deal with. And all I'm trying to do is to build into that a slightly more sophisticated and careful observation. But it is that building in of a more sophisticated and careful observation that I think has something to say to your earlier question about what is theological education designed to do in the future. One of the pioneers of empirical theology, uh, Hans van der Ven from the Catholic University in Nijmegen, produced what I think is an excellent book in about 1998 called Education for Reflective Ministry. As an empirical theologian, he sees reflective ministry to be based on astute observation of the context in which ministry takes place. And of course, there's nothing novel in that, but there is no when you begin to encourage the practitioners to do the research themselves and to take the research techniques seriously. So I've been pleased over the years to have a range of priests and ministers from other traditions working with me and getting their doctorate research done with me and then moving into significant posts of leadership within church. And I see that as kind of helpful to be aware of what the evidence is. Great. Thank you, thank you Leslie. And well, thank on behalf of the group here, I say a sincere thank you for your preparation and the distribution of your uh, uh, article to us. I distribute it to those who are doing uh, uh, the course on uh, ethics for the 21st century. If others want a copy of it, just send me uh, uh, an email and I'll uh, distribute it uh, to you. And uh, so, from all of us, Leslie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To those who are online, thank you for uh, being with us. And uh, for those who are here, thank you for your attention. And uh, we will recess now for 15 minutes or so. Uh, there's coffee made in the, pot, in the uh, common room and other goodies available there. So uh, help yourselves. Great. Welcome. Thank you. And... Uh, We'll sign off on the webinar. Thanks again, Leslie. Thank you, Rick. Great. Good wishes for the day. Great. Chat soon. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs>